and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping um, Educational Program. Um, and welcome everyone this morning. And today, Dr. Lester and I are together again, yay, um, to uh, talk about the common misconceptions that we that we hear. And I know Bill has a lot of his favorite um, myths that he hears about Florida um, gardening. This is just part one. Um, and you know, with the advent of the internet, we can obtain a lot of knowledge, but we can also obtain a lot of misinformation, believe it or not. So we're gonna talk about some of those, just a few of the common myths they were around before the internet, but you know, the internet just spreads things like faster than wildfire, I think. And this is part one, part two will be next week and Bill will be with me again. And that is, we're gonna concentrate solely on lawns next week. Did yeah, you know a lot that? of bad information about lawns out there. Yes. And um, I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities, work for the water department here in Hernando County. And today I have my regular co-host. I get to say that this time. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't done this for a while, have we? Yes, Dr. William Lester. He is the urban horticulture agent at the Hernando County um, Extension Office. Here are our emails. You can email either one of us. Um, if you want a PDF copy of this, which I kind of have a feeling you're going to want one because of a lot of the written information on here, um, then email me. If you want a PDF copy, you know, even right after the class, and I'll get it to you, you know, today. Um, and or you can email Bill, and he'll just forward it to me. <laughs> but if you have questions, I do that. yeah, if you have questions for either of us, then certainly feel free to email us. Oh, PJ didn't get in. We thought we let her She's in. Having problems getting in. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's start off then. Fire ants, fire ants. Um, you know, I don't hear as much about them as when we first moved here uh, in 1978, when I was 11 years old. I just gave, you know, gave you my age. But um, the, we got to visit what was then called Likes Memorial Hospital within the first week of living here in Florida. Not for me, but for my mother who encountered fire ants. And she was, you know, had been bitten pretty severely. And well, she's one who reacts to bee stings, reacted to bee stings and those kind of poison ivy would go crazy on her. So yeah, she had a pretty bad reaction to the fire ants. Um, and then in later years, you know, uh, Benadryl was uh, <laughs> created, so um, she was able to handle it better. I don't hear that much anymore like we did in the, even the 80s and 90s, you know, about fire ants. They're still out there, but people aren't complaining as much about them. Maybe they're just gotten used to it. But if you have them in your yard and spring is, seems to be a time they love to pop up, the drier the weather, the more fire ants I have personally. So let's talk about some of the myths that we hear about fire ants and grits. That's one of the main ones that it, they are going to eat the grits and this, their stomach is going to explode. What do you have to say about that, Dr. Lester? Yeah, grits don't make ants explode. Certain ants are going to eat the grits, but it doesn't have any kind of um, deterrent effect or pesticidal effect on them. So grits, even though that you may see that they eat them and the grits disappear, are not going to be effective at controlling ants, any kind of ants. And usually you dump anything on their mound that's going to alert them that something amiss is going on and they'll probably just move. You know, that could be what's happening. 
A lot of people swear by soda water, club soda, because of the carbonation. Does that do anything to the ant anatomy? I've never really heard that. No, no soda water and club soda isn't going to work at all. Okay. Oh, this one. Well, no one's going to do this right now because yeah, yeah. no one can afford to do this right now. But they say diesel fuel. That is a environmental nightmare. Please don't pour any kind of fuel product on the ground. I mean, maybe it'll work if you kill the ants, but that is a or that's an environmental nightmare. You don't want that yeah. in your drinking water. It only takes a tiny amount of either diesel or regular gasoline to pollute a very, very large amount of water, like a lake or a retention pond or something like that. So you don't you don't ever want to use that outdoors. Citrus peels is maybe headed sort of in the right direction. It's just not quite quite there yet. Do you think citrus peels are gonna do much of anything? It'll make them angry and might deter them from a very specific spot where you don't want them, but it's not going to eliminate them at all. And there's this my favorite one. <laughs> Creating ant wars by shoveling the mounds together. First of all, that sounds dangerous for you. How you're going to knock it bit in that process. I am not even sure, but will that work? <laughs> I've never really heard that suggestion. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe if you have way too much time on your hands and a little bit too much curiosity, you may consider something like that, but it's not really an effective way to get rid of fire ants. No, you're not going to incite fire ant civil wars by <laughs> shoveling the mounds together. So, um, what do we do? What does work? That's why I have the good doctor here to tell us what would be an effective way in treating fire ants in your yard. I can tell you, I um, will spot treat utilizing a bait treatment, but even doing that, really what happens is my neighbor and I play fire ant chess back and forth in each other's yards. <laughs> so I'll let you yeah. take over here. <laughs> Baits work the best. And you have to put them out at the right time of year, generally in the spring, although you can have ants at different times of the year, depending on how wet or how dry it is. Um, the different pesticides that you have listed here, w at least one of those, it would be the active ingredient in Amdro, which Amdro is effective, but sometimes it seems like all you're doing is just moving the ant hill from spot to spot to spot. One thing that is very, very effective and also very um, safe to use is spinosad. And you're going to see that as the active ingredient in more and more baits. Spinosad works very, very well on ants and thrips and caterpillars. Kind of a weird mix, but and spinosad comes from a naturally occurring bacteria, so safe to use. Yes, I've heard you mention spinosad many times and only in doing this research that I'm like, oh, it's a fermented bacteria. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other ones, um, diatomaceous earth, I don't think works very well on ants. Yeah. It's a, a powder that comes from prehistoric little seashells that are all ground up. So for very small insects, it obviously it's, it's like them walking across glass, but the first time it rains or you water, it's all dissolved and washed away. So it doesn't last for very long. In the world of ants, you have ants that like to eat high protein things and other ones that like to eat sugary things. So the ones that like the sugary things, if you use the um, boric acid ant bait, works very very well on those little tiny insects that you'll sometimes get in your kitchen or inside of your house mm -hmm. most of the ones in your yard prefer high protein foods that's why um some of the different baits that you might use outside it's basically think of bacon bits impregnated with pesticide that's how they make it so it's very very high protein and it's going to be attractive to them 
But if you have an ant problem, you need to kind of figure out, is this an ant that likes protein or sugar? And that's going to determine what kind of control or what kind of bait is going to work the best. And the hot water one kind of scares me. <laughs> it scares that me. That just, that moves them. That right. will kill a lot of the colony, but doesn't generally kill the queen. And it won't get rid of the ants. It will make them very angry and probably make them move. But long term, it's not going to be a very good solution. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, not all the ants in your yard are fire ants. Some people think that every ant is a fire ant. And that's not true. We have a couple hundred species of ants here in Central Florida. Many of them are beneficial out in your yard. Some of them eat nothing but weed seeds. And obviously that's beneficial. That's a good little mm -hmm. bonus to have out in your yard. Other ones will give you a lot of um, pest control. They'll eat insect pests off of your plants. So a lot of ants are beneficial. Only a few of them are true fire ants that are going to bite you and injure you. Not, you know, in the world of ants, many of them don't bite or sting at all. Right. So we have a lot of diversity in the ant world and not all of them need to be controlled. So if you see ants out in the middle of your front yard, you know what I do? I just ignore them unless right. they become a real, a real and, threat or danger to me. And the more of our native ants that we have, they're going to take up that niche, you know, that these fire ants might otherwise be taking up. Um, yeah, the funny thing is, we have a newer um, invasive ant here in Central Florida called the Tawny Crazy Ant. And you don't want to get this. And I noticed that uh, Heather just joined us, and I think that she has them on her property. You don't want this kind of ant living on your property because they reproduce like crazy and they make millions and millions of ants. But the strange thing is, they will actually drive true fire ants off of your property. So if you get crazy ants, you won't have fire ants, but you'll have crazy ants, which <laughs> in some ways is even worse than fire ants. So kind of pick your poison, but some ants will drive off other ants. They compete. They do actually go to war with each other. But not within the same species. And No, not yeah. generally within the same species. Um, what I was hinting at with the citrus peels, saying they were kind of headed in the right direction, throwing your tangerine peelings <laughs> on an ant mound might please the rats at night. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but um, where you were headed in the right direction, you know, a um, processed citrus peel oil, such as is found in this D limonene. And I've read about this, um, this mound drench a few years ago. Um, it was associated up with Leon County Extension Office and um, which Buddy's joining us today, but they followed this farmer who um, used a mound trench using this, this citrus peel oil. Now she had to do repeated applications, but she did find success. And also she found success by going out and treating really early in the morning because the queens are closer to the top in the early morning. So if you get the queen, you get the mount. Mm -hmm. So that's just another uh, product to look for. Um, but Florida Friendly Landscaping in no way recommends broadcast treatment of pesticides all over your entire yard ever. And we're going to get into that too. Let's talk about moles next because moles are very frustrating because we don't have a really good answer. <laughs> for you, but we can tell you nope. none of these three things are the answer. Um, this uh, photographer in Vanderbilt, Kenneth Catan Catania, I would like to um, recognize his skill <laughs> in obtaining this picture of this moth, but I hate this picture. <laughs> <laughs> It just really creeps me out. It's something like from the Princess Bride or something like that, but this is a real mole. And the picture I did not share because I just could not handle it at all, which if you look at um, when I give you resources, if you go to the publication on moles, is the star nose mole. <laughs> they have a picture of that. <laughs> anyway, 
you, uh, they advertise on, you know, late night TV or other places, these um, machines that will create vibrations that is supposed to annoy the moles into going away. Um, does the University of Florida find those effective, Dr. Lester? No, not particularly. Things like vibrations and all the different old wives' tales about chewing gum and dog fur and dryer lint and everything else, stuffing those in their holes. Mm -hmm. What it can do is aggravate them and annoy them and make them leave your property and go somewhere else. So those things but might work as a deterrent, but none of them are going to actually cause any anything well, the damaging mothballs, or bad to happen to the mole. Yeah, the mothballs is actually illegal, isn't it? Yes, mothballs are illegal to use outdoors. Mothballs are a pesticide. Obviously, you're supposed to use them in your clothes, in the closet to deter moths. And do people have clothes that get clothes moths anymore? I'm... I haven't heard about it since I was a child. And yeah, I, think, I haven't heard you know, about it since I was a kid also. I don't know if anybody... Because uh, you know, I think we've gone to so much synthetic fabrics anymore that, you know, we're mm -hmm. not attractive to the moths. If you use an insecticide in a way that does not line up with what is on the label, then you're breaking the law and you're legally liable for anything bad that might happen. So if you use mothballs in your yard for to control moles or people think that it keeps snakes away, which it really doesn't, or keep uh, lizards or something else away, and a child in your neighborhood gets a hold of one or a neighbor's aunt, pet, or anything else, you're totally liable for anything bad that happens because you put mothballs outside. Mm -hmm. Anything used in, inconsistent with its labeling is is against the law. You can be held liable. There's his bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what does work, Dr. Lester? Guacamole? <laughs> Sometimes that seems like it and moles and gophers, there are, there is no really, really good control. Um, they do have very nasty traps that you can set up and you have to be very careful with them. Um, they're kind of difficult to set and it's going to take a little while for them to work, but they and are nasty little traps that will actually, um, kill the mole or gopher right. as most, they go through the tunnel. Most of them, most of them are lethal. Yes, trapping is lethal. Um, barriers really aren't going to work because the moles and gophers cruise around your entire yard. Like I said, sometimes if you keep, if you diligently annoy them, they'll just leave and go to your neighbor's yard and then problem solved for you. I, not for I your would neighbor. say, you know, as far as vibrations, the vibrations from your own feet stomp on, you know, Every time one of their holes comes up, you know, and it moves the dirt around, stomp it back down, just annoy them. Sure. <laughs> and if you go out there and gently push the soil back down after they've made a tunnel, your grass will be fine. If they're not going to kill your grass, right? It's just the, the holes and tunnels might look unsightly. If you go out there and fill in the holes and push down the tunnels, your grass is going to do just fine. Are we had there? a gopher. Um, in front of our office uh, a year or two ago that was there for a while and he he made a circle around the entire front lawn area and one day just disappeared right. they are eaten by snakes hawks birds of prey coyotes there's a lot of different animals that will eat them so that they're not going to be in your yard for years on end it's a short-term visitor basically and i imagine like your husky would know if there was something underground he would be like jumping on the ground and everything <laughs> it would other. confuse them i i knew of somebody who had two dogs that would actually listen for moles and gophers and they go out there and they cock their head and listen and then they start digging and they'll they would actually catch them wow so if you and have he, a good hunting dog that's that's the solution too and if you have a very very wet area they seem to prefer those so if, you know, if you are overwatering, that could, you know, be, you could be inviting them 
or like Bill was insinuating, just live with them and they're going to go away. Something is going to get them eventually. That may not be easy because if you're in a homeowners um, association, a deed restricted community, you may be getting letters, you know, faster than the mole decides to move away. But going to those extreme um, methods that we mentioned before, they're just not going to work. So don't wait, don't waste your money on stuff that's not going to work. Speaking of which, now this, this one is where it gets confused because soap can control aphids. The problem is, again, let's go back to when we were kids, um, used to drive my sister and I crazy. My mother would buy pink dish liquid or <laughs> yellow dish liquid because it was the cheapest stuff. And you had to, you know, with your hands, make bubbles for the dish. <laughs> yeah, 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 the pink stuff. Yes, that was real soap. There was no detergent in it. You know, the ivory kind of soap too. Um, that did not have any detergent in it. Almost every dish soap you're going to buy today has detergent in it. So why I have watch for online clickbait, this is for any of this stuff. You know, got a problem with moles, you know, watch what you're clicking on. They're not actually going to have an article that will be helpful for you. They just want you to see their billions of um, advertisements. So uh, most dish soaps out there today, you know, something like Dawn. And yes, it is. That's why it helps clean the oil spills, you know, helps get it off of the sea life and the birds because it's a degreaser. But using degreasers on uh, your plants well, this I took directly from a University of Florida publication using products not registered by the EPA, and we were insinuating this as pesticides is taking a big risk. We at UF IBIS do not recommend these mixes for a number of reasons. The safety hazard to plants, animals, and people are significant. Finally, application of unregistered chemicals onto crops sold as food is illegal. And why we're pointing at, you know, this, this label here saying the label is the law, that'll show you, you know, the detergent, the, de the degreaser that's in there. So it is really, I mean, you can get recipes um, for soap and oil. Just make sure you have pure soap and follow that recipe very well or purchase a horticultural oil or soap. And here I'll let Dr. Lester take over about what does work. Yeah, I put a link to a really good University of Florida fact sheet, which is probably the one that you read also mm -hmm. on managing pests with soaps written by Dr. Matt Borden and Dr. Adam Dale. Mm -hmm. And I even had a, a bookmarked on my computer to keep mm -hmm. it handy. And it, it gives a lot of really good information about, you know, um, the potential dangers, mostly to your plants about using different types of dish soaps and laundry detergents and everything else and why you would want to use a properly labeled pesticide like um, uh, insecticidal soap because mm -hmm. it's labeled for use on plants against insects. If you follow the label directions, it's not going to hurt your plants. It is effective on a wide variety of insects. Those are all on the label generally very small soft bodied insects it works great on and when i'm giving pest control recommendations to people for any aphids white flies mealybugs spider mites anything like that insecticidal soap is all a homeowner needs horticultural oil works very well also but you don't want to use that during the summer when it's very sunny and hot because then it will damage your plants on a very very sunny hot day You'll be frying them, yeah. It, yes, it will basically fry them. <laughs> and I've seen that happen before on uh, pole beans that they used oil on and it was too sunny and too hot. And it looked like they had just hit them with a flamethrower. They yeah. grew back, but it knocked them back badly for a couple of weeks. So you don't want to make that mistake. If you have just a few aphids, you could just take a garden hose and very gently spray them off the plant. That works. Biological control, if you look very closely and properly identify your pests. Like in this picture, we have aphids 
and I could see from the aphids that are kind of copper colored or brownish and they're not moving, they're dead. And they've been parasitized by a very, very tiny little wasp that lays eggs in them and kills them. It eats them from the inside out. So if you look at your plant and you have some aphids, but you have, let's say, ladybugs or green lacewings or a beneficial insect, maybe you don't have to spray at all. It's like, yeah, I got a couple aphids, but I got ladybugs and ladybugs look like they're eating them. So I'm going to leave them be. I'm going to check back in a few days, but for right now, you might not have to do anything if you have beneficial insects there keeping them under control and doing the work for you. And you don't want to kill off those beneficial insects, you know, with friendly fire either. Um, you know, have them be a casualty of your all-out war. Um, you you spray everything in your yard, and everything dies, and the good bugs take longer to regenerate, and the bad bugs do. And then you have more of a problem. <laughs> so Yeah, if you spray your entire yard on a really, really regular basis or have a surf service do that, you may end up with really, really bizarre insect pest problems that even I can't tell you what to do to fix them. <laughs> and I could, I could tell you some stories, mostly from that large um, uh, community to the north of us, where they have services come and just spray everything in their yard like on a monthly basis and they don't even know what they're spraying for and they end up with a huge outbreak of um magnolia scales all over the magnolia tree nobody has that problem <laughs> normal yeah. people don't have magnolia scales all over the magnolia tree actually <laughs> causing damage so i don't know what to tell i'm not going to tell them spray more because obviously that's what caused the problem right so yeah, and you think about it, you know, you think about survival of the fittest. So when you spray, who are you killing? The weak ones. Who have you left to regenerate? The strong ones. Congratulations, you just created a super race of, you know, insects. Best thing, spot tree. When we're going to get into that, you're going to evaluate how bad is this problem? Do I need to treat it and treat only that problem? But we'll get to that too. Um, we do a lot of work with mosquito control. Um, for those you know who have seen a lot of my classes where Karen Mohika from Mosquito Control comes on and talks to us. Well, um, if you want to see her, you got to go down to Pasco County because she's now with Pasco County Mosquito Control. And I have not heard whether they you know have um, filled her position yet. So that's something exciting to look forward to to see who that's going to be and how we can work with them. But, you know, a lot of questions Karen would get is, what about all these different plants that you can put around your patio or whatever to um, keep the mosquitoes away? You know, uh, citronella grass, you can have them as plants. They make candles out of it. Rosemary, catnip, all these uh, herbs, lavender. You can't really, you can't grow lavender here anyway, <laughs> very well. Uh, marigolds, even beautyberry, that's the old, um, native Floridian um, answer to it. And I'm not saying that these, you know, plants don't possess some sort of elements that do repel mosquitoes and even carnivorous plants. Carnivorous plants are not going to eat as many mosquitoes as you need them to, <laughs> you know, they, um, and all these others, unless you process, you know, what's in them to use, you know, just having the plants, Karen used to say that might work for about an hour and then the mosquitoes will get, will get used to them. So what things do work uh, with mosquito control? And this first one is what I heard from mosquito control all the time, this term. <laughs> the the source to... reduction. You need to dump all the standing water and a lot of times you don't realize that you have standing water in your yard without going out there and carefully walking around your property. I know that when mosquito control and this and every county in Florida by law has to have a mosquito control department. So everybody here, if you're in Florida, you have a mosquito control department. 
if you contact them and say, I have a huge problem with lots of mosquitoes, they'll come out and look around. The first thing they look for is standing water on your property. So very important that you dump that out. And a lot of times you may have a tarp on top of a boat or a camper or firewood or something in your backyard that's holding water. It doesn't have to be a lot of water. It only has to be like a tablespoon of water for mosquitoes to breathe in it. So dumping standing water is your number one line of defense. And then using some kind of um, uh, cover up or some kind of protectant. Uh, DEET is the recommended active ingredient. And there is another one now that's recommended mm -hmm. for people who don't like DEET. And yeah, um, it's on the publication that I have. Um, yeah. Yeah, they mentioned the other chemical. Um, I can't remember its name either. And Karen has talked about it too. Yeah, a lot of people swear by um, some of the different essential oils that they would get from some of those plants that you had on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. But just having one of those plants growing in your yard is not going to impact or affect a mosquito at all. If you take and that plant refining. and crush it and rub it on yourself, that may have an effect. But right. they found that a lot of those uh, essential oils do deter mosquitoes and they work for five to 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So well, if you want to put it on every 10 minutes, it's going to work. But, you know, once and done isn't going to work with that. And that reminds me, I also read in the publication um, that the combination sunscreen and mosquito uh prevention you know mosquito repellents they don't recommend those because they don't want you to put on mosquito repellent as often as you need to reapply sunscreen yeah yeah and we are plant people here and here's this bromeliad which a lot of people are very much in love with but you know part of their their structure is they do hold water um i think in nature um, you never see bromeliads planted in mass as, you know, people put them all together. So we're kind of creating more of a, a problem where in nature there might not have been, you know, we have a whole bunch together that's holding that water in. Um, bromeliads, you had said, Dr. Lester, don't attract the um, disease-causing insects, uh, disease-causing mosquitoes. But still, who wants mosquitoes <laughs> in general around? So what we recommend is if you're going to have the bromeliads, hose them out, push that water out with the hose once a week, just like you would clean your uh, bird bath at least once a week, every four or five days. Um, I just read somewhere, somebody uh, mentioned um, pushing the your leaf blower, you know, through the bromeliads to kind of blow the water out. I don't know how good that would be for the uh, wildlife. It might be, worth, it might be worth trying. Eh, it might not be that good for the other wildlife that you want to keep. But, you know, flush them out. If you're a snowbird, if you travel a lot, even if you're not a snowbird, then you probably don't want to keep bromeliads because then while you're gone, they're going to fill up with water, especially if you're gone all summer, and you'll have very unhappy neighbors. Now, calling mosquito control, no matter what county you're in, don't be afraid. They are not um, code enforcement. They're there to help you. So, and your county mosquito control will not charge you. I've seen pesticide companies even advertising mosquito control, you know. I'm not sure what it is they're putting around, but your county mosquito control will, they wanna help you with that source reduction. They wanna look all over and show you, maybe you have a tree hole, you know, maybe it's your gutters, maybe it is your neighbors, you know, um, causing the issues, but they, they're they not there to fine you or <laughs> cause any issues, they're there to help you. So, oh, and that mosquito fish, that's a fun, a fun thing too. I know yes, there's, there's two species of little fish. Most people would look at it and say it's a minnow. It's about that size. And they gobble up mosquitoes. They eat the mosquito larva in the water. So if you have a garden pond, even people out in the country who have livestock and they have the great big mm -hmm. water containers for the livestock to drink out of, will put mosquito fish in them 
to help keep the mosquito larva under control. And you can get them from mosquito control because they raise them. At least here. We can't we just speak anywhere Here, else. yeah. I'm, I have no idea yeah. about any other counties, but here yeah. in Hernando County, no county our mosquito yes, control yes. department does raise them, and you can request them and get them. For free. Mm -hmm. And they'll come out and put them in your pond, um, your animal troughs, you know, your little water feature, you know. As long as it holds water all of the time, they're not going to put it in a big puddle that you have because... You know they don't want their fish to die so but and they'll even come out and replenish them um because you know birds and things do munch on the, on the fish too now let's go back to that you know everyone likes to put the marigolds around their vegetable gardens because they're told you know that that'll be helpful i think it'll be helpful in attracting pollinators <laughs> Mm -hmm. But as far as nematode control, okay, marigolds does have that uh, element in them that can repel nematodes, but it's in how you use it. So you would have to use it as a cover crop for two months before you plant your vegetable garden to get those right, those good effects. Buying a whole bunch of marigolds as a cover crop would be insanely expensive don't you think <laughs> dr lester well it does work but they have to be french marigolds so old-fashioned french marigolds so it has to be the right type of marigold and you grow it as a cover crop and then you cut it down you turn it under and as it's breaking down it releases a chemical that's in the plant that I don't even know if it really kills nematodes, but it drives them away. So in technically it is an effective nematode control, but you have to do it correctly for it to work. If you just interplant it with your tomatoes and peppers and okra, it's not going to work. The nematodes are still there. They're still going to attack your vegetables. They're just not going to attack the marigold. Okay. Or planting like a nice pretty square around your vegetable garden. You've got to do it ahead of time to get that element mixed in there. But like I like we've said, you know, how much is each little annual <laughs> marigold? You know, you spend three, four dollars per marigold. That is a very expensive cover crop. So yes, it is. What, <laughs> what does work? Um, if you are planting, let's say, uh, vegetables in a vegetable garden. If you try to find nematode resistant uh, varieties to grow, that helps a lot. There are, so like, for example, tomatoes, there's a lot of nematode resistant tomatoes. So they will get some nematodes, but they're not going to suffer. And the nematodes don't cause a lot of damage to them. Soil solarization for a homeowner is probably your best bet. There's really no chemical controls that you know, a homeowner can get their hands on, even for I, commercial no, growers. I don't think there's any homeowner nematicide that you can purchase. You know, there is one on the market now, and it's made from an oil from a tree, and it helps. Won't get rid of all the nematodes, doesn't kill all the nematodes, but they really, really don't like this stuff, and you have to apply it every week or two during the growing season. But there's very, very, very few chemical control. There's no good effective chemical control. So if you have a problem with nematodes, try to solarize your soil every summer. That really helps, it drives them away, but they'll come back. Um, you may wanna be careful about growing crops that nematodes really like. Their all time favorite thing is okra. So I had a, um, a University of Florida instructor that said a nematode would dig a tunnel underneath I-75 to get to an okra plant. So it's <laughs> definitely their favorite. Well, let's back up for a second. Maybe we got ahead of people. What's a nematode? <laughs> a nematode is a microscopic um, roundworm that lives in the soil. And there's thousands of species of them. A lot of them eat bacteria. A lot of them eat fungi. Some nematodes eat other nematodes. They're little cannibals. They eat each other. But some species of nematodes will eat plants' roots. 
So what they do is they drill into the plant's roots and either live inside the root or right on the outside. And the one that most people are most commonly aware of is root knot nematodes. So they damage the roots, they make the roots swell up, you get these big bumps and balls on the uh, roots. It damages the roots, so now your plant can't take up water, can't take up nutrients, they wilt a lot. And certain things like tomatoes get them really bad. Okra, like I said, is their favorite. Peppers can have nematode problems. Squash, green beans, a lot of different vegetables have problems with nematodes. If you have them in your garden, really bad. So the soil solarization, see he's just putting uh, clear plastic down. So your spring um, garden is going to be finishing up around beginning of June here. And that would, that would be a good time then to solarize that, just put down that clear plastic and hold it down until what, September? Yes, University of Florida has fact sheets on there that kind of take it step by step what to do. But basically you clear out your garden patch, get all the weeds and plants out, make sure it's moist and then cover it with clear plastic. And clear. during the summer when it gets really sunny, the sun shines through the plastic and makes the soil really hot at the surface. And nematodes don't like that. It's gonna drive them out of your garden. So in the fall, when you pull the plastic off and you plant your fall garden, you won't have any nematodes in there for a while. They'll come back because they can move through the soil, but they don't move really, really quickly. So it does give you a clear time period where you don't have any nematodes but they will come back. We keep going back to our childhoods. <laughs> it reminds me of, and this was up north though, seems like the, the old timers up north, they had windows, like old windows that they would build like over wood and stuff. They would use glass to solarize the soil. Is that, that works too, or we just don't need to go to that expense anymore? Is that? That works also. You want to use glass, you know, gla glass, of course, is very, very expensive. Most people don't have access to it, right. but you want to use um, thick, clear plastic to let the sun shine through. People used to use black plastic, which also gets hot, but not nearly as hot as the clear will, because you're trying to get the, your soil really hot. Um, now let's just, I, we alluded to that broadcast screen, spray it all, you know, and we do have lots of people here in Florida where that's just part of their monthly routine. The company comes and they spray their whole yard with something because the only good bug is a dead bug. Um, what do you have to say about, well, we covered a bit of that, but do you have any more to add to that? Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people kind of um, fall into that, that treadmill and without even knowing what their insect pest problem is. Maybe they don't even have an insect pest problem. They have a service come out and spray. They don't know what they're spraying. They don't know why they're spraying it. They and put up that sign that says, don't go near here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people think that there's huge number of insects out there and if you don't preventatively spray for them your lawn's going to die and your trees are going to die everything's going to die outside and that's just not true usually when a lawn dies a tree dies a bush dies flowers die whatever it might be outside it's some something other than an insect pest it might be a disease a lot of times it's from poor management so people manage their lawns very poorly and even if you have a lawn service, they don't necessarily manage it well. And then if you manage it poorly, you're going to have problems. You may blame it on an insect and start spraying, even though you don't know what the insect is, you can't see it. Don't get on that cycle because it leads, it doesn't work out well as a general rule. And our office is we always get phone calls and emails after they've done everything else and everything else has failed. We're always the last one, it seems like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. To, to get this. And sometimes it's like- I, I did this, now fix it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, uh, and I'm showing this this picture, you know, to kind of point out to you, at least around here, these this uh, white ibis that um, our friend Alice Mary Hurden took this photo of, and I hadn't noticed right away. But look, see, there's a little insect popping into to their mouth. Oh, they, I live in Spring Hill, of... and, and I get them on a regular basis. If I look outside early in the morning, there's a whole bunch of them, and they're just marching through my front yard. Right. They're taking and I'm not sure exactly the what they're eating, but they're eating a lot of it. So then they're taking care of the insects for you. Yep. And do you want to poison these these pretty guys, you know? <laughs> or the sandhill cranes or any anything else that comes through, any other birds or anything. So no, the only good bug is not a dead bug. We have lots and lots and lots of beneficial bugs who are allies who are helping us. We are lots who aren't doing much of anything. They're kind of inert, but you know what? They are food for these guys. And even some of the bad guys are, you know, serve as food for these guys too. So everything has its purpose. If we just get out of the way <laughs> and let nature do its thing, we're going to be a lot better off. So in pest control in general, this is what I alluded to. I found this interesting because this right here is the same old uh, integrated pest management pyramid that if you look back on some of our older classes, we talk about all the time, but they've added to this like before the pyramid. And I really like this before the integrated pest management period, you have things you need to do first too. And that's identify the problem is number one. Don't just, there's a problem. I don't like it. I don't know what it is. So throw some chemical on it. No, find out what it is. Once you know what it is, monitor it. So then you can decide if anything needs to be done. All these things before this human intervention. And I'll let you get into the, the pyramid part of it too. Sure, after you properly identify what your problem is and definitely come to the informed conclusion that that is the source of your problem and you monitor it and it's risen to the point where you need to take some kind of control you need to decide if anything needs to be done or if you just need to keep monitoring it and make sure it doesn't get out of control um the different types of intervention cultural control is managing things correctly that could be anything from correct uh irrigation fertilizing uh, getting a soil test, growing the right plant in the right place. If you put azaleas in the full sun, they will die. No amount of insecticide is going to change that because azaleas don't grow in the full sun. If you try growing blueberries in a very alkaline soil, they will die very quickly. At least they mm -hmm. die a quick painless death. No amount of insecticide is going to change that because blueberries need a very acidic soil to grow in. So cultural control, Mechanical control is things like going out there and pulling weeds, proper pruning. Biological control is leaving those uh, beneficial insects. And if they're present, maybe give them a chance to do their thing and let the ladybugs eat the aphids before you run out to your shed and grab your bottle of spray and spray for the aphids. Uh, if you do need to take chemical control, you need to use the correct chemical. You need to start with the um, safest to use, least toxic thing that's going to be effective. And if you contact us and shoot us an email, this is my pro or here's a picture. What is it? We can tell you usually from the pictures what your problem is and what's going to be safe and effective to use on it. And then evaluation is very important. You can't always do just one and done. You're going to have to go back and double check and did this work? Was it effective? Did I maybe misidentify what the problem is? Did I think it was this problem, but my problem is really I'm cutting my grass way too short and I need to change that. So you're going to have to go back and evaluate and make sure that you've got it right and see if there's any adjustments that you need to make in your control program. So it takes a little bit of effort. It takes education um, for the technical questions and technical advice. That's what we're here for. If mm -hmm. it's a really complicated question, send it to Lily. <laughs> and Lily knows how to forward her emails, right? To uh, 
after exactly this? we'll just pass it back and forth but we'll get an answer one way or the other <laughs> yes all right um this is one we hear about a lot now you've lived in florida since the early 80s right and i mid 80s somewhere in there and i've lived here since 78 and i have i own a home you own a home currently do you have monthly pest control come into your house oh no we used to many 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 years ago and i got rid of them i never have and people you know i see on the neighborhood groups the neighborhood i live in you know well i just moved here um what pest control companies should i get because someone has told them you moved to florida you got to have monthly pest control are you overloaded with roaches dr lester at your house no and the sad thing about that when people at you know move here and they say what's a good pest control company everybody jumps in and starts giving the names of their service somebody that they know their brother-in-law whoever it might be nobody ever asks the question what's your problem right that's the first thing to ask you, is, do you have a problem yeah i have what a, is your problem yeah i have a few spiders occasionally um used to have a lot of daddy long legs um well, up where i live in northwestern um Fernando County, uh, an occasional scorpion will get in, but you know that's none of those things terrify me to you know to the point where I think I need to spray all these chemicals in my house. No, 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 and I, I would never. Um, and that's part of the reason why we got rid of the service many years ago is they would just regularly um, put granules around the outside of the house. And they couldn't tell me why they were doing it. And it didn't seem to be effective at anything to me other than probably reducing my population of anoles and lizards, which is my first line of defense against bugs. Right. We occasionally get ants that come in from outside. And mm -hmm. I do have ant control and ant bait. A year or two ago, I got um, some Australian roaches in the garage in the middle of summer. Not unusual. I got a bait and put the bait around, boom, within a couple of days, problem solved. Right. That's what so I did too, Lynn. If you have ago. a problem and you have to pay a service to come out and spray every 30 days, they're not doing a very good job. They're not fixing your problem. Now, communal living is a different story. If you're in an apartment or something like that, that's a lot harder to, to deal sure. with. Yeah. Because um, your, your neighbor is constant, you know, it depends on what your neighbors are doing or not doing. Sure. And that's when you contact uh, Dr. Lester there, and he can get a hold of his boss, uh, Jim Davis, who is a fairly good expert on home pest control and what to do as well. So, oh, yeah, we need to get moving. See, you said I had a small amount of slides, and I told you we would talk a lot about each one. Weed control. This I hear a lot about, you know, baking soda, vinegar, Epsom salts, bleach. Or again, we're back to the dish soaps. And I don't know about the baking soda, but probably the others would definitely kill a weed. <laughs> but are they effective general weed control? No, not long term. And kind of going through them really quickly. I've never really heard of using baking soda. I have heard about using, everybody loves the idea of using vinegar to kill weeds. If you, and grocery store vinegar is maybe 6% acid, you can buy types of vinegar that's labeled as an herbicide. It's much, much higher acidity. Dangerous, you gotta wear gloves. You don't wanna get it on you. So it's not the kind of vinegar that you throw on your salad. It's gonna be effective on little teeny tiny weeds that have just come up and it only burns them back. It doesn't kill the roots. So they're most likely gonna grow back pretty quickly. Epsom salts don't work. Bleach, bleach is going to kill a plant, but it's going to grow back. Same with dish soaps. Dish, if you spray dish detergent on weeds and it's very sunny and hot out there, it's going to scorch them and kill them, but they're going to grow back. So none of them are effective long term. And all of them, I'm not sure how much of any of the stuff you want to be throwing out in your flower beds, garden, lawn, whatever it might be. Do you have any of this Florida pusley in your yard? 
Oh yeah, I got a whole bunch. Yeah, me too. Do you care? No, butterflies like it. Yeah, I don't care either. So, and it's green, and if I keep it cut, uh, the boss won't get angry at me. So, <laughs> so um, what does work? Tell me about what weeds. What does work with uh, dealing with weeds? You can learn to live with them. So there's nothing inherently wrong with a weedy lawn. Just keep it cut. Uh, keep it looking, you know, reasonably decent for your neighbors. Obviously, if you live in a homeowners association, you're in a totally different switch situation than Lily and I are. Neither one of us do. Mm -hmm. uh, pulling weeds up by hand. None of them have developed a defense against that. <laughs> for lawns. A really good plan to follow is manage your grass correctly, keep it healthy, keep it growing, and it's generally going to outcompete and push out the weeds. So you're not going to have a huge weed problem. But if you become a purist where you just can't tolerate a single weed in your lawn, you're going to have a tough way to go through life. So, um, Are you telling both of you there? <laughs> Yes, we're both here today, and the phone rings on a regular basis. So, no, it's not. Yeah, like if you can't tolerate time. any weeds, you're going to have a tough way to go through life. You're going to spend a lot of money, go through a lot of chemicals. A lot of that stuff is going to end up in our groundwater, and you're probably not going to be 100% successful. Uh, obviously, if you have a close to perfect St. Augustine lawn and you only have a few weeds, just get out there and bend over and pull them out. It's good exercise. We all need more exercise, I think. So there are benefits to that. This chamber bitter should start coming up, especially in flower beds and stuff now. Pull it before it gets those little seeds on it. And yeah, an awful lot of the weed problems we have are seasonal. So this chamber bitter comes up and grows like crazy right now. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be all over the place. In a few months, it disappears. Mm -hmm. and it's gone for the rest of the year so there's no point killing yourself and spraying for weeds that are going to disappear really soon on their own so well, weeds prevention is important if you send us pictures or bring specific weeds by our office we could tell you what the weed is and then what the biology of the weed is and what kind of plan to follow let's just talk about a few miscellaneous things as we're Moving along, we're getting on to an hour here. Um, Spanish moss kills trees as well does ball moss and this lichen, this picture right here. Nope, none of those kills trees. None of them damages trees. They are all naturally out there on healthy trees and they're on dead trees that died for some other reason. So don't make the mistake of you walk outside, your tree is either dead or dying you look and you see Spanish moss or lichen or ball moss or something else and blame it. It may not be the culprit. It may just be there. It's probably something else that killed your tree. So these different things you don't need to remove. You don't need to spray. Oh my gosh, there are services out there that will spray copper fungicide on your don't tree. Tell them. I and never tell them what it is that they can use. <laughs> you know what you end up with? If you spray your tree with copper fungicide to get rid of Spanish moss, a tree that's covered with black goo. Yeah. Because it will kill it and will turn it to black goo. And it's very dangerous. It's very nasty. Don't do that. Now, you could have so much on there. If there's so much Spanish moss growing, your tree's in decline for another reason. But you can have yeah. it physically removed to take off a branch or something. But it's not really causing any issues. And in fact, this is something I only learned a year or two ago. Our state butterfly, the zebra longwing, uses Spanish moss to sleep in. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Did Aww. you know? Yes. Um, and sometimes, you know, it kind of annoys me that people, you know, have the idea that Spanish moss is a danger to the trees because it was here. It was here long before any European-based human, <laughs> you know, came into um our state it's not these things aren't causing any issues here's one of our friends let's talk about him before we go uh the lubber grasshopper that they will just come in and eat 
your entire yard. Yeah, people get very excited over lover grasshoppers because they're so large and obvious, I think. And mm -hmm. when they hatch in the spring, they if you have them, you may have very, very large numbers of them. That tends to scare people. Lover grasshoppers will eat your amaryllis bulbs, crinum lily bulbs, any other kind of lilies or anything in that family that's growing in your yard. Young citrus, they can be very damaging on. A few other plants, but they don't eat everything. And I know I can go outside probably right now and um, we have a um, holly hedge right out front and I could find a few lovers on it. I'm sure mine have hatched for the spring. And they're always sitting on the holly. They don't eat it. If they do, I've never noticed a they leaf that's been chewed on. It, but yeah. You know, and and holly's you really to... thick and tough. And, you know, there's there's nothing eats hollies, basically. Yeah. Nothing, so nothing damages that hedge. And so if don't think that if, them... if you have lovers in your lawn, they don't damage your lawn. If you have them on the side of your house, they're not eating your house. So keep it. You know, keep it under control. You know, lovers do damage certain things, but they don't damage everything. And don't go into a panic if you have just a couple lovers. And if you have those bulbs and so you're concerned, the best thing to do is to find them. Go out, look now, see if you find, when they're young, they hang out together. They are gregarious. They are that's gregarious. That's the scientific term. So that's the, the vocabulary word for today, gregarious. They're gregarious. That means they're just so friendly. Uh -huh. And you can take your hand and scoop this entire crew here into a bucket of soapy water. You try to kill this guy, nothing's going to get through that uh, suit of armor there. You Don't even try a chemical on him. You're going to have to use that mechanical control, which may include your foot, which will be gross. <laughs> or, you know, just let him move on. I did hear something interesting from your master gardener, Bernie, that on great occasion because they are you know in the locust family something will switch in their brains when there's a lot of them together to cause them to go into that plague-like behavior where they will eat everything for you know like a short period of time and he said one of the tells you'll find them on your screens pretty often i do if they are eating that screen then there's a time to be concerned yeah, that and that's a different species of grasshopper that we have a problem. It's been a number of years since we had a problem. We're due yeah. for an outbreak of them. They'll become a big problem in field areas. Yes, that's where he uh, said he saw, yeah. You would, Normally, yeah. You, you don't see them in people's yards, although when they, if every 20 years we have a big outbreak and you'll, people will find them in their yards or properties, but it tends to be out in fields or large properties. But this big, scary-looking guy is probably not causing you tremendous harm. So the yeah, last and thing... it, when they're big, you could just pick them up and throw them over the fence, toss them in your neighbor's yard. Never, never, never do. move next door to Dr. Lester. It's amazing the things he <laughs> talks about that he does to his neighbors. But anyway, here's the big one, the last one. The University of Florida created love bugs. Now, why did they? Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that one came control? from. <laughs> yes. Um, it, I don't know where it came from, but it's a pretty big, um, <laughs> pretty big myth out there. So, are we at the point where any um, university lab that you know of can create new life? <laughs> new. No. <laughs> and. Love bugs were not brought here to Florida. They moved here on their own. They're native to um, Central America, Mexico. They moved up and around the Gulf Coast many years ago, moved into Florida all on their own. And Lily, you've lived in Florida for about as long as I have. You probably remember that many years ago, they were a big problem. You would have they a lot of terrible. them. They were terrible. You couldn't drive 10 miles without having to stop and clean your windshield. And people would be driving in the country and they'd be all over the windshield. If you hit the windshield wipers, it's like you took black paint and just okay. and people would get in accidents and actually die from driving through clouds of love bugs and they cover the windshield. You can't see you run off the road. They're nowhere near as bad now because other mm -hmm. beneficial other insects have found them and are feeding on them. And now the population of love bugs is under control. 
is not completely out of control. And we did not release any beneficial insects to control them. It all just over time happened naturally. So Started love bugs moving. will always be with us. They'll never, they might get, depending on where you live, you may think they're bad, but they're nowhere near as bad as they used to be. There are records of first reporting sightings of them uh, in Florida in the 1940s. So especially think, you know, was there the technology at the time, you know, to, you know, no, they came naturally up from, from Mexico through Texas, all that. And they hatch yeah. out twice a year. They come out of the ground in May and September. They are a nuisance. But they don't bite. They don't cause, uh, they don't eat any crops. So just something we have to put up with. And, and they have no impact on mosquitoes, good or no. bad or indifferent. They have no, no impact. So where do you go to find out the right information? Because you can handle the truth. Um, what I do, you know, the internet can be a very useful tool if you know how to use it correctly. So if you're looking for this information, always kind of look for that .edu, meaning it's coming from some land grant university. Um, and if you're looking for Florida information, of course, the best place to look is Florida, but maybe, maybe University of Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, some Texas stuff might be useful for you. Maybe even some Clemson, some South Carolina stuff, but you do have to pick and choose because Florida is so unique. So, you know, what I do is whatever your subject you're looking for, mosquitoes, and then put in that IFAS, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, or mosquitoes, UF, for University of Florida, to make sure you're getting publications, blogs, information from your land grant university here in Florida that is research based, you know, and not anyone trying to sell you anything at all. There's a bookstore at the university, the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences bookstore. They have a website, great books that they sell on a lot of this information. And of course, I have to throw in the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, website, which will, there's so much information to find on there. Here is the Hernando County Extension Office phone number, 352-754-4433. You can call Dr. Lester, you can talk to, or you can email Dr. Lester. You can call on a Thursday when we have Bernie, the, who mans the plant clinic. Um, the best thing he would love in the world is for you to give him a question he's never heard before, so he can research it and get back to you. And of course, either Bill or I, you can contact. Here's a list of all the University of Florida <laughs> resources I used oh my. To, to put this together. That's why you might want that uh, the copy of the PDF. But yeah, I used a lot of resources, but you see they're all University of Florida, all research you know, based information. And these volumes one, two, and three of myths, they'll get into stuff I didn't um, cover today as well. Here's upcoming classes. We've got more classes coming. And Dr. Lester likes the timeline the way I I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it makes us look good that PowerPoint, as you said before, basically builds itself now. <laughs> it's got this really neat feature. You put in the information and tell it to choose a design for you. <laughs> and boom. Here we go. But here's Next week, it'll be you and I again, for the same subject, except we're focusing solely on lawns because there's a lot of information, misinformation about lawns. Then on the 30th, I'm going to be talking about native bees um, here in uh, Hernando County or in Central Florida. So bee specific, I'm talking about just about native bees. April 6th, Dr. Lester has a program that he asked me if he could share it. And I'm like, well, sure, of course. Uh, <laughs> you already have it made. All I have to do is host you. Mm -hmm. And what is that one about, Dr. Lester? That's about keeping your eyes open for and identifying invasive species 
That could be anything from an insect to a four foot long lizard to anything in between. And if you do see something in your yard and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what this is, different resources for getting it identified and who to report it to. There's some, we're going to be talking about um, Florida Wildlife Commission, reporting it to them. Uh, iNaturalist and there's a lot of other online services where you can post pictures that help you identify it and then if it's something that needs to be reported you have an idea of exactly who to report it to and how. Yeah. Then we have rain barrel and compost bin workshops twice a month. You want to find out about that the first thing to do is email me and then I'm uh, glad to share that with you. If you want an in-person or you know someone who's like, I'm not watching the computer, they want to come to an in-person class, April 13th, 2.30 in the afternoon, and I'll be at the Spring Hill Library talking about everything you always wanted to know about your Florida lawn. Don't be upset if you can't make that because it's going to find its way into these virtual classes probably in May. And on April 20th, I'm going to be with uh, Carmen Bruno of Hernando County uh, Solid Waste is our recycling coordinator. And since that is so close to Earth Day, we're gonna be talking about recycling inside in the house. That's his territory and out. That's my territory. And speaking of Earth Day, -na -na -na, there we go, Dr. Lester. <laughs> we wanna have Saturday, April 23rd at our Master Gardener's Nursery. We are going to have a, a morning event to celebrate Earth Day. We have Florida friendly plants for sale, lots and lots of native plants for sale. We're gonna have master gardeners there to answer your questions. We're gonna have a workshop on pollinators from one of our master gardeners who's a retired um, entomologist from National Forest Service. A macro photography workshop with a photography expert and lots of fun things going on. So definitely put that on your calendar. Yep, and that's right here in Brooksville. So I think that is going to be a fun day. And again, you have you want a PDF, please email me. If you have a question, uh, please email Bill. There we go. <laughs> or you can ask questions from any of us. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Lester, as usual. Oh, thank you for having me. And uh, tomorrow we'll be together again at the virtual plant clinic. So check on either of our Facebook pages for that link at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. That is for those who may not know, although a lot of you listening are um, regular participants, that is where we just kind of talk impromptu and randomly. And that's when you can bring your questions to us and uh, try and stump us. <laughs> so, Yes, yeah, sometimes it's very random. Yes. <laughs> but always interesting. And poop always comes up for some reason. So you know, might yeah, want to. I don't know why that is. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And we will see you either tomorrow or next week or both. Thank you and have a great Florida-friendly day.